You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to Filmmaking Conversations with Damian Swaby. Listen to conversations with award-winning filmmakers, directors from the golden age of television, and creatives from the indie film community who continue to inspire the next generation of filmmakers. And now, over to your host, Damien Swaby. Hello, and welcome to today's podcast episode of Filmmaking Conversations with me, Damien Swaby. I've got a great guest on the podcast today. I completely love speaking to her. We had a great podcast, and I'm going to say from the start, I hope she's able to come back on again because we only hit the tip of the iceberg. As the recent Vice President of Creative Affairs, at Feynman Entertainment. Emily Hardy has been the sole creative executive of E.P. Ross Feynman at A&E Studios, identifying, developing, pitching and overseeing all scripted content. The Lincoln Lawyer on Netflix heading into season three. Big Sky on ABC for three seasons. Goliath on Amazon for four seasons with one series ordered in Australia and many more developed at HBO, CBS, ABC, TNT, AMC, and internationally. Prior to her eight years plus as an executive, Emily started as an actor, sag Afra, writer and creative producer. She's worn so many hats, she's become a Hollywood Swiss army knife with a passion for a certain dance style that we'll speak about a bit more in the podcast. But to date, her proudest achievement is to have mentored and taught story and script development as well as staging and performance to incarnated youth ages between 14 to 17 at the juvenile probation camp David Gonzalez in Los Angeles. She's passionate about imparting knowledge and helping underrepresented voices prepare their stories for the market. Now let's dive deep into this brilliant, if I don't say so myself, filmmaking conversation. Emily, how are you today? I'm good, Damien. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. Glad to have you on the podcast. Someone who can write and act and teach within the television and film industry. It's going to be a great conversation because you certainly are a triple threat and some. Thank you. Thank you. I try. No, no. Not at all. Not at all. So which of these skills that you have did you start off with? Because, it, you know, a lot of people come on the podcast and they, you know, they may have done study performing arts or they may have went to film school and then you kind of decide what you'll do in film when you've been to film school. But out of the, the, the things you do, what did you start off learning first? That's a difficult question to answer because in some ways I started doing them all around the same time. Um, probably... Lovely. Probably my interest in dance came about first, but I think very quickly writing and acting came came up. Probably it went dance, writing, acting as a child. Um, but professionally, I started as an actor, so it's it's all over the place. Um, I because uh, I, growing up, I did all kinds of dance. I was in figure skating. I was in I, I took tap dance and all kinds of things, and um, but then in high school, I got into writing and, and also acting. I remember my my junior year of my of high school, I was I had an honors English class, and whenever there was a thesis paper due, there would be a line of all of my fellow students up to my desk, reaching to the doorway of the classroom, with each of their papers for me to critique for them just because I liked to do it and I was good at it and they they wanted the help. So they would bring me their paper and I would be like, okay, you want to move this idea up to the top and you want to like do this thing. And like, you have a typo here. And like, I would just like next, next. And, huh. and I had no idea. Apparently my teacher was sitting watching this, like, you know, just stunned. And um, it wasn't until, and I had forgotten about that until years later, I connected with that teacher. I was like, do you remember me? I was in your class. And he says, how can I forget you? All the students brought their papers to you to be, to be proofed. So I, um, I mean, I was writing myself, but it was even early on, there was a sense of like, I loved writing so much. I wanted to help other people write. Um, 
But then I got into acting and then professionally I transitioned from acting into producing and started doing all kinds of creative things from casting to making commercials and indie films and you know wearing all the hats for those projects um and then then i got into television so it's been a very circuitous route um i sometimes say i'm a swiss army knife I, <laughs> I've, I've done all the things at this point what do you need i can i can act it i can write it i can dance it excellent wow that is a journey itself wow but when you start making films you know a lot of people come from different backgrounds in terms of like, I personally was an actor myself many moons ago and I started making short films. What were some of the difficulties you faced when you started to produce a short film? Because there's so much to do when you're making a short. Yes, um, and probably the most difficult part for me is, is not necessarily the, diff the most difficult part for everybody, but um, the most difficult was like the fundraising and the outreach. I mean, not that it's not difficult, but like the, the selling of it was probably the part that I liked the least. I, I always want to like sit in the creative corner and like, let's figure out the story, do this. And it's like, yeah, but we need money. Let's get somebody else to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was probably the hardest part. Um, but yeah, it's so, um, uh, it's probably just, you know what the hardest part is about, about filmmaking is keeping the momentum up for all, for how long it takes. Yes. <laughs> keeping, keeping the enthusiasm up, keeping the, the motivation, um, you know, being excited about it a year later, two years <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, I can completely agree. Keeping that motivation and the momentum and the energy up uh, with all the trials and tribulations that come along when you're making a short film or any project for that matter sometimes is quite hard to do. But you've got some really, really um, interesting work that you've done. You've experienced developing television drama series for top tier platforms such as Netflix, HBO and Amazon. How has it influenced your perspective on te storytelling? The developing for television has, has definitely um, expanded my idea of story because, of course, now you're you're working in multi-season storylines and you're and you're you're creating characters in the pilot that you not only have to service by the end of the season but the next and the next and it's like what's going to happen to this character in season three and those are the things you have to start thinking about from the beginning which in the business you didn't used to have to do you you would make a pilot and if you've got a season three you'll worry about it when you get there um mm -hmm. and now they very much want to have a roadmap from you i think um a lot of that a lot of it is because of the corporate environment in LA and not just LA, but but the the tech companies and even the traditional distributors are now owned by these huge media conglomerates. And all the choices are ultimately geared toward what makes the people upstairs happy. And that's not always what makes the best uh, storytelling. And so yeah. There's a big part of that job that's also wrestling with the corporate interest to keep it as commercial as possible. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with being commercial, but it also, um, but sometimes, sometimes it's, uh, if you're going to be commercial, it should also be good. <laughs> so have you had those difficult conversations with people at the top uh, and how do they usually pan out? Uh, well, it, context is everything. Depends on who you're talking to. Depends on what it is. Um, but it is, you know, I definitely find that as a development executive, it is your job to be oppositional. They don't say that, but you're there to serve the story. And so there have been there have been numerous times where I was getting ready to give a note or pitch something or or and it's like oh this is not gonna there this is not gonna be received very well but you know yeah. but i have to say it because it's like because it's the story and you're not serving this and you've you've forgotten that or or sometimes it's an issue of sensitivity and it's it's like you can't say that to a woman you can't say that to somebody like that like you you can't do that anymore you know and yeah. it's and uh, um and so it's, it's it's quite often the development executive's job, I think, to be unpopular if they're doing their job. Sometimes sometimes I, I get the eye rolls. It's like, well, you know what? Somebody had to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair 
fair enough. That is true. Somebody has to. That's the, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. Your role as a development mentor and competition judge contributing to nurturing new talent. What do you look for in emerging stories and storytellers? Honestly, and and this is going to this is going to sound very, very personal, but it's not. I'm looking for something that that engages me emotionally right away. Even if it doesn't make a lot of sense, even if it's like, you know, a weird story or whatever, but like, I'm looking for something that like, ooh, that, I I felt something when you said that. Um, and that, and quite often that's like the little diamond in the idea. And then you've got to clear everything away to get to it. Um, like uh, there was this one wonderful project that I encountered and it, it, you know, it's always, it's, it's also a matter of like the right story has to come into the right person's mind in order for it to get made. You know, yeah. somebody can have a, have a great idea and maybe it doesn't go anywhere. But, but like, so I, I met this one writer who had this wonderful story. Um, she had spent a whole career working in the DMV, um, which is Department of Motor Vehicles in the US. And it's, it's the most boring bureaucratic place. We all hate to go there to get our licenses renewed and all that kind of stuff. And um, she, but and but she had come up with this idea for a workplace comedy set there, and I could see it, and it was like, oh my god, because we've all been there. It's so boring. It's so terrible, and you're always curious about these people behind the desk. And um, and she didn't quite have, you know, she had a lot of story that wasn't that wouldn't have been useful for a TV series that she had in in the in the story. Uh, and but I could see the. I was like, I, I wanted to work with her, even though she was not, um, she was a first time writer. She was a baby writer. She hadn't, she hadn't done anything. And, and it was, it was like, it would have been easier to, to take an interest in a project that was closer to the finish line. But it was like, it was her authentic story. She was an immigrant. She had spent her whole life working in the DMV with other people who were immigrants and like really interesting characters. And she had such an interesting personality. And I could just see these quirky characters in an office-like setting, but it's the DMV. And um, it was just, yeah, there, there's just, because when it resonates with me, and it, and I don't think it's just like, I, I have an opinion like everyone, and if it resonates with me, it will resonate with everyone. I don't mean that. But when there's a little thing that hits me in the gut. I'm a sensitive enough divining rod artistically Okay. that when it's like, it's like, I can, I can, there's something good in there. I know that if they dig that out and, and build around that, like it will be, I can feel that it will, that it will be a satisfying story for, for others. There's a, a sort of an empathetic, ah, there's some truth in there. We can dig it out. Nice one. I like that. So what do you not like um, when you look at stories or what kind of puts you off and makes you think, oh no, what have, why have I read this? <laughs> um, um, oh, probably the, the things where you've seen it done this way 27 times in the last month. Okay. Or, or yeah. it's like, it's like they did that already. You just, you just lifted this from that other show or whatever, you know, it's like the, there's just a, like a paint by number feel a sense that like, okay, you know, or if, 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 as I'm reading it, I'm like, when I turn the page, the detective's going to show up and then he's going to say this. Yep. <laughs> that is what happened. I, I, I hear like, you. If I can, if I can see everything coming before I read it, then maybe we need to work on it. Yeah. I've, uh, I got sent a script a couple of weeks ago um, and it was basically taken you know the film taken oh yeah yeah and i and i just kind of said to the guy like you know why why i, I don't understand they like, tell your story or tell a, a different story you know everyone knows yeah. taken and there's been maybe you could say there's been different versions of taken other films are kind of use that template well once or twice um Definitely. so I a just few times. <laughs> it's um it's it's not the the, the best when people uh Sending you things that have already been done and you're not going to get excited yeah. about. And the, and the buyers can be guilty of that too. I mean, I remember like even just now, um, like uh, the number of times I have heard, we're 
looking for the next Game of Thrones, or we're looking for the next Big Little Lies, or we're looking for the next this or that. And it's like, no, you're not. You already have a show with dragons. You don't want another yeah. show with dragons. You mean you want another hit show or you don't want Big Little Lies. We've already had Big Little Lies. Nobody's gonna buy that again. You mean you want something that catches fire and anything might catch fire. It's not, but but the, but the nobody, nobody in Hollywood ever wants to hear that. It's a total crapshoot. Nobody really knows what they're doing. Everyone's just fucking around. I'm sorry, can I swear on this? <laughs> Yes, certainly. Okay. Fuck it, do it. Every, everyone's just fucking around, doing their best. Every, everybody, I think everybody's in earnest, but like, there is no science to this. It is an art form. And um, yes, it's a commercial product, but it is an art form. And you never can tell what's going to resonate with people. And generally, what's going to resonate with people is not the trappings, like, ooh, it's set in the future. People love movies set in the future. No, they don't. Or people love period movies. Like, no, people like a good story that gets mm. them in the guts. And if it happens to be in space, great. Or if it happens to be set in the past, great. But like, you've got to have something to say. And not that everything has to have a message and be tied up in a bow, yeah. but like, there has to be, there has to be some kind of artistic, emotional, need in this um, yes. for the for the people making it in order for it to translate to us watching it and given your extensive background in the industry how do you see the evolution of television and drama over the past decade particularly with the rise of streaming services it's a tricky one um the the streaming model came in obviously and disrupted the whole uh industry because as many people know, I'm not saying anything that's new. The legacy distributors, the networks, the the, the broadcasters, the cable, and and so forth, they only make money by making movies and television. And so, in every business decision, they are incentivized to actually make the product. the The tech companies, the movies and TV, are a drop in the bucket for them. If that part of their business goes away, they don't care. And so, like we saw that in the strikes this summer. They, they felt like they could hold out forever because we don't actually need you. We don't actually need to do this. And that was why the AMT, AMPTP was having trouble negotiating because what the streamers want is completely different than what the broadcasters want. So it's, it's created yeah. this fairly unsustainable system of make as much television as you can and we'll figure out how to, how to you know, do the subscribers part of it later. And of course, now all the streaming services are starting to put in commercials, are starting to mm. put in different tiers where you pay for less commercial, for fewer commercials. And you, um, and like, you know, they're, they're starting to get into live sports and all the things that regular television has because that's what keeps the lights on. And so, yeah. like, so tech came in and disrupted the town. But I think the realities of Hollywood will probably push the tech companies and therefore the rest of us back to hopefully a more sustainable model of making slightly fewer things, but making hopefully better things. I don't know, maybe that's too much to offer, to ask for, but, um, <laughs> but, 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 but making, um, I don't know, making, making at least more unique things because there's so much television right now that like, yeah. People tell me about a show and it sounds like seven different other shows that I heard about. Yeah. And and it's like, I, I don't okay, well, I can't keep track of it. People are like, have you seen this? No, I, I don't like I, I used to see like all the television and now it's like there's just too much. I just, you know, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> so how many uh subscriptions do you do you have? Uh Netflix, Apple, Hulu, Amazon. I think Paramount Plus. Yeah. And, Plus, uh, um, yeah. And you don't have Disney? No, no, not yet. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'll I'll probably get it at some point because they'll probably have something that I, I can't resist seeing. Um, yeah. But uh, so far, so far, no. So I, I only ask because it feels like everyone has four. Like everyone mm -hmm. I've spoken to has four subscriptions of, and then you have like television cable or whatever. And you're right. There is 
so much to watch. It's you, you, you can't catch up or keep up with everything. Um, and when people do say, "Oh, have you seen this? You, you see that? You do start to think, have, have I seen that? Sounds like something else." Yeah, it, it gets all kind of muddled in that way. But yeah. you, as a performer. Could you walk us through your process of developing a character for performance and how does your writing experience inform your acting? That's interesting. Um, in many ways, I feel like it's my acting experience that informs my writing experience more often, but where when I'm developing a character as an actor, something, something I, I'll tell you what, where the writing experience does come in very helpfully is when the writing is not especially great <laughs> for the character. And as a writer, I can look at it and and also having worked in television and worked in development, I can look at the script and realize, oh, this moment is not playing on the page, but I know what they're going for. I have seen yeah. this kind of a moment in the story before. So I understand what they're trying to get, even though they weren't actually able to convey it. Um, and I've also I've also had those moments with directors where they're like, they're mm. they're um the director's trying really hard to like help me do something. And it's like, no, 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 we're just you just want ABC. And they go, Oh, yeah, that's that's yeah, I know. That's okay. We can go. <laughs> Oh, so a lot of it is like just anticipate like and also like when you work in Hollywood long enough and you you get familiar enough with everybody else's jobs, you also learn how to do your own job in a way that serves the machine more easily because you 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 know that oh the lighting person is gonna need me to do this, the sound person is gonna need me to do this, the director is gonna need me to do this and so forth, and and so that there's a certain amount of that, but you were asking about building the character. Um, as an actor, um, I've, I've studied a lot of methods at this point, and I've actually reached a point where I don't, I don't do as much character building as I used to. It was a thing that I did more like in my twenties and thirties, uh, when I was a young actor and probably didn't have more confidence. Um, I do character building now more like I will absolutely research everything that I have to know so that I'm familiar with this character's world. And I know all the things all the terms that the character needs to say so that they can roll off my tongue the way that they're supposed to. Um, but I don't do a lot of internal building anymore um, because I find that intellectually distracting while I'm acting. If I'm trying to think about, oh yes, because I, I, I likened this character to my mother and now I'm thinking about my mother, which is sometimes confusing while you're in the middle of, of yeah. working. And so I prefer to, to just let the writing and let the story take me. And now I have enough confidence as an actor that I know that that happens. And so it's more, I know all the things I need to know. I, I've, of course, I know all my lines, everything is, everything is learned, but then I let how I'm really feeling in the moment be the thing out of which the character's lines come. Because if you plan on how you're going to feel on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., mm you're not going to feel that way. You're going to have yeah. to push it. If you're, if you're, if you're determined to like hit this particular note, you're going to have to make it happen. And then if you make it happen, it's not quite as juicy as if you just set it out of how you feel right now and, and, and let that be the truth. And I, and then also a good director and editor can take that and make it mm. into the interesting performance later, um, but but it works the way the same way in live performance in theater. You you never want it to be perfect and and to sound like something we've rehearsed a hundred times before. You always want it to sound fresh and real and like I just said it now and just thought it. Um, and I think that can only come from letting from not having pre planned how you're going to say it, how you're going to feel it, how that moment's going to happen. And just look at the other person and how do I want to say it now? So tell us about a time you've been incredibly happy with your performance as an actress. Well, I, I'm, I'm pretty proud of, I mean, I've, I've, I've been, I've been happy with a lot of things, but um, I'm pretty proud of a, a, a movie I did. There was a horror movie I did several years ago 
where I got oh. to play the main character. Um, so I nice. got to survive the movie um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, kill the bad guy in the end and all that good stuff. And it was, uh, it was my first horror movie. And I, um, I was very nervous and it was like all night shoots in the desert freezing and um, very difficult production. But that probably added to a lot of the, the realism, you know, cause when you're running for your life in the desert in the middle of the night, like <laughs> it doesn't take yeah. a lot to imagine there's really somebody behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so the, it's a, she's a character who, um, I'm particularly proud of her because although I, I didn't write this, she's a character who, um, as soon as people start dying in the movie, she's less concerned about her own safety than she is about helping everybody else. Cause she knows who all the victims are going to be. And so she needs oh. to get to them in time. And, um, cause it's, it's jurors. Somebody's picking off all the jurors that sent somebody away. And so she knows who the other jurors are. And um, so it's, it's just a, it's, it's lovely to play a, a character who had that tender a heart and, and who gets to uh, be the adventurous person who saves the day. And so I felt like there was a lot of, I don't know, a lot of, a lot of my own, um, probably it's, it's, it's because I would want to be that person in that situation. Oh. I, would I would want to be the person who thinks of others. I would want to be the person who goes back for the whole community and not just saving myself. And so- Very nice um, of you. Sort of getting, oh, thanks. I'm not saying I definitely would do it. I don't know for sure, <laughs> but I would like to be that person. <laughs> um, and so it was, it was good to, to, to live in that, in that skin for a while and get to, and get to be the, the Girl Scout who saves the day. Um, and I felt like there was a lot of honesty in that because I was enjoying it. How important was the relationship you had with the director on set for that film? Do you think you could have carved out your performance without the director? I definitely couldn't have carved out the same performance without that director because uh, um, Michael Nichols, different than Mike Nichols, uh, very good guy, uh, very sensitive director, um, also had been an actor first. So, and I think that that helps. Um, and he was very sensitive to my process and not intrusive. And I think that's, I think that's the mark of a great director is somebody, you know, as long as you've done a good job of casting, the director ought to create a vibe on set where everybody can do their best work, where everybody feels confident and supported and everybody feels like there's room for you to bring your own best ideas um, and that kind of collaborative trust in the people you've hired mm. brings out a lot of confidence in them and brings out their desire to give their best. Um, if I'd had a less aware and present director, I could still have done an emotionally resonant performance, but I would not have been quite as relaxed because I would not have felt like I was in this safe space yeah. where I can where I can play because it's like it's very much it's very much like being a baby or whatever they you, you need the you need we need we need the soft edges around you we're going to put yeah. you in your little your little play area and we're promised you're not going to get hurt now you can do anything you want <laughs> very true good analogy I like that one <laughs> you mentioned earlier about when you're dealing with executives or certain people at a higher level as a um, development producer and, and everything like that, you have to consider commercial aspects of the production. Mm -hmm. As an actress, how do you maintain artistic integrity when you're acting? It's tough. Um, especially if, if as an executive or, or at, if through my experience, I, I become aware of what their expectations are. That's very, okay. that's very difficult. It's like, you don't want to know those as an actor. You should never, you should, you should never know what they think of you or what they want from you. <laughs> or like, like, no, I mean, like you should know what they want from you in performance, but like all the, because the people who are not actors who are making the decisions upstairs, um, don't it's like it's like if you were if you were a plumber 
you would know as you're looking at pipes, oh, this is all wrong, or this is really mm -hmm. well done, or they've used good materials. Similarly, people who who aren't actors don't always know what makes good acting. I think I think you know, backed at, bad acting can jump out at the screen on you, but good acting can be very subtle and it can be yeah. hard to spot who are the good actors unless you've seen them in a range of performances. And even then, like it's it's tough. So you oftentimes you get decisions made at the top that are a lot more to do with how well known the actor is, how how famous they are, how much they're likely to draw in an audience. And that's like, that's one of the hugest things, but it's, um, sorry, you were asking about expectations of the actor. Yeah, it's, in that case, it's really more a, a, an exercise in shutting out <laughs> what you think their expectations might be so that you can, uh, you can do your own thing because also their expectations don't mean anything because they're the expectations of, of ignorance. It, they don't okay. know what to expect of you sometimes as an actor. And so quite often it's your job to bring it and for them to say yes or no, take it again. Um, I, I would much rather that than somebody who figured it all out in their head and would like me to do it the way that they have it in their head. Like that, that's, that's the kiss of death where it's like, I'm not in your head. I'm not going to be able to make it the way that it's in your head because that's your idea. You have yeah. to trust the actor to be themselves and to bring their own thing and to be like, Oh, I would never have told them to do that, but that feels so truthful. I like it. Let's keep it. Um, so I think it's, and it, so it's hard to be the actor and to know that that's what you need and to to balance that with the the ignorance of, of, of people who might have expectations i think it's um so so a lot of what what a lot of what you do sometimes as an actor is you get some kind of nonsense direction that you can't use or or you you become aware of an expectation that's not going to help you um and you, you just respond to it with a, oh, that's very interesting. That's really cool. Let me think about that. Let me, let me, let me try one like that. And then maybe you do, or maybe you don't, but, but, and, and, you know, it, by the time, by the time we've taken the take, they've forgotten what they've told you anyway. They just are trying yeah. to, so often they're just trying to justify their existence. So they, they want to be the smart one who told you the right thing. I completely hear you. I completely hear you. When you pick up and a I, pen. I don't mean to make it sound like it's all idiots upstairs in Hollywood it's no, not no. but it, you know it's it's I it, it should it, it people should be aware that like I have I've definitely and I've talked to friends in law friends in politics in other fields outside of entertainment at the highest levels the highest echelons of power it's all high school there are no adults it's everybody's <laughs> everybody's still like doing their there's, there's ego this and these people are feeling, and it's all so childish and it's like, oh my God, can we just like make some art? But you know, that's just part of the job. Yes, part of the job indeed. So the last time you picked up a pen, what did you write and why? Oh, I mean, besides just, you know, journaling, I journal every day. Um, oh, You mean okay. creative writing? I meant creative writing, but if I may ask, uh, this is slightly not filmmaking. I'm not sure if I should. What do you journal? Oh, I started keeping a journal since I was 11 years old. Um, I don't necessarily journal absolutely every day. Um, and I'm 42 now. So what is that? Okay. 30 odd years. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, um, I'm a very, I'm, I love language. I mean, I got into, I got in, I, I love writing because of the language, I, language is so musical. I, I just, it's a, it's such a fantastic thing. And um, sorry, I just wandered away thinking about language. What was your original question? <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, what do you journal? Like, I, oh, okay. you know, obviously yeah, I want to know as well. What do you, yeah, what, what do you journal? Yeah, um, I, yeah, just got started writing down my, you know, this happened today and so forth. When you're a little kid, of course, like so-and-so was mean to me, I was sad, you know, that, that, that kind of stuff. But um, but now it's definitely become journaling. What? Sorry, I interrupted. Very rude of me. I don't usually do that. Sorry. That's all right. That's all right. Was it a uh, question? Yeah. Um, what, what did you journal today? 
Oh, what did I, I haven't journaled yet today because I'll, I'll probably journal after I talk to you. Um, but, okay. but what journaling has become more recently is, is a blend of what might have happened today and also what I'm thinking about creatively. And like, like I'm, I'm working on a book, I'm working on various screenplays or whatever I'm, whatever I'm working on, like, and I'll, I'll get an idea about it. And I'll, you know, I was thinking about this thing that happened in my life, but also when I get to chapter four, I'm going to need to say something about the blah, 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 blah you know? Oh. Um, so it's a, it's, it's become more, which, which makes it difficult to go back over the, the journal ever and like find notes. Cause it's like, I'm looking for story notes and it's oh. like, Oh no, this is personal. Okay, here we go. Story, <laughs> personal story, personal. The line between story and, and <laughs> personal is becoming blurred. I suppose it's a metaphor. Yes, yes. And creatively, what what was the last thing you you put together? Um, well, what I'm the last thing I finished, or what, what I'm currently working on. Oh, you finished the last thing you finished. Okay, okay. Um, probably. Oh, probably. Probably the last thing I, one of the last thing I finished is it's because it's, it's funny. It was a it was a short scene, a little a little short film, that was you know, a seven or eight page scene, but it was it was written just to amuse a friend of mine. Um, she, we were we were working in the same office, and and she was getting really frustrated with her day, and I took I took a little bit of time and I wrote out this, um, this scene about her in the midst of the frustration she was experiencing and then a funny thing happens to like blow it all up and I, I just did it to cheer her up and so I wrote this this little this little short film out and I don't know probably in an afternoon and I and I sent it to her and it, it cracked her up so it did exactly what it was supposed to do that's very kind of you I've never heard anyone say they've done that you know I've heard someone say oh, they've <laughs> sent a nice email like cheer up you know things can get better or whatever but to, to actually write a short film for someone is a uh, very nice is that something you do when some, one of your mates are down you put together no it script? was it was a very it was it was because i wanted to i wanted to imagine this funny scenario she was uh, she was doing a job that i had that i had done and so i was very familiar about the frustration she was doing a lot of phone work and she was talking to people on the phones and it was very and she was getting more and more more frustrated and I knew all the ways that that was frustrating and so um it was I, it's it's not something that I do often it was just uh I had this this burst of creativity and thought this would cheer her up and amuse me so nice one <laughs> nice one you think it's something that might get developed do you would you still make a short film even actually oh I could that that one would require that would either have to be animated or it would require so much CG because it, it, it what it involves is, is an explosion that takes up the entire universe. Yeah. A pretty, pretty big film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of scope for a short film. So it's, it's, it would be hard to get that sort of thing made, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm not pushing to get that one made anytime soon. And being a creative, you know, it's when we grow up, we, you know, a lot of people want to be creatives. They want to, act dancing and, and all types of different things what was it like for you growing up that you came to the decision to be a creative were you fully supported or did you parents maybe have I, a preference being a doctor or a lawyer that type of thing um, actually my parents were surprisingly supportive it was my grandfather who was who was probably the and 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 some extended family members but my dad's dad because um, sorry, my dad is a musician, and my oh. mom was she she passed this year, but my mom was kind of a Renaissance woman. She was a thank you. She was a she wrote. She was also a seamstress. She was a wonderful seamstress, and she would design clothing and quilts and all. Excuse me, all kinds of stuff. And um, so they were both very creative, and so they probably weren't too surprised that I wanted to be an actor. Cause like first I came to them and said, I want to be an actor. I want to go to drama school. I want to go to Hollywood. I want to be an actor. And they were, you know, they were very surprised, but they, um, they were okay. This is, you know, this is what you want to do and you're working toward it. And, and they also, they had also seen me like I'd been doing community theater and things like that. Oh, and like I was really, you know, 
beyond school plays. I was very into it. So they they trusted that. But then I told my my grandfather, who, by the way, had not had a great reaction when my dad became a musician. So okay. my dad came to his dad and said, Dad, I want to be a musician. His father, who's who was an engineer, was like, what are you talking about? That's not a real job. You have to get a real job. You can't be a musician. What the hell? No son of mine, you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so, you know, so my dad defied him, went to music school, became a musician. He's a violinist and a violist. And um, so when I told my grandfather that I wanted to be an actor, he was like, well, that's not a real job. You can't, you can't do that. That's not, that's not any good. Like all the same stuff that he had told him. And at some point he said, like, you have to get something, you know, that you can at least fall back on, something stable, like welding. And I was like, really? You, th <laughs> you think I'm going to be a welder? You know, and he didn't. He was, it was probably just the only thing that came to mind in that moment. But um, yeah. I was so, I was so mad at him. And I, I remember we were at my grandparents' house and he said this and I stormed out of the house, you know, smashed out the front door and, and they, wow. they lived on this property. And so I went walking down this long easement toward the main road, that's like a quarter mile. And I was just <laughs> on, this, <laughs> on this angry walk. And uh, my dad uh, saw this and came running out of the house and caught up to me. And we took that walk to the road and back, back together. And he talked to me and he was like, and I, of course I was like, and then grandpa said this, <laughs> and then he said this. And, and, and dad said that he said all the same things to me when I told him I wanted to be a musician. He doesn't get it. He's an engineer and he doesn't get it. And it's not that he doesn't love you. He just doesn't get it. And he can't be there for you. And it's like in this way and like, don't let that hold you back. And I was just, okay. <laughs> um, but it was, it was great. So I, um, not everybody was supportive, but the right people were, and that was enough for me. I love that. The right people were, and that's enough yeah. for you. I'm glad you had the right people who fully supported you. Otherwise we would have missed out on a lot of creative talents that you've given us. Oh, thank you. And lastly, this is slightly not a filmmaking one. That's okay. Um, <laughs> dancing. There's a special kind mm -hmm. of dance that you like doing. Can you tell us about that? Yes, flamenco. Um, I got into flamenco just a few years ago. I, I didn't grow up doing it. It's not something that, I, you know, I had to be a beginner at 40. And so that was very humbling. Excellent. But um, but it's it's good for you. Like you, if you, you know, I think I think when we're after a certain age, we should start doing all kinds of things brand new. Yeah. I think, I think we should have more adult beginners at everything. Um, cause I, I, I think, I think it keeps you humble like nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> Being in a classroom, like, like, especially like, I, I remember I was, a, I, I took a, I took an adult ballet class, but it was like, there was like younger people and like they were dancing circles around me. And I was just like, this is, this is just sad. Anyway. So flamenco, I got started. Um, I had always, I had loved it for a lot of years. I had been watching, you know, like Carmen Amaya videos on YouTube and things like that. And it was in the pandemic, but it, we, we were finally coming out of the, the lockdown quarantine and, and not having to mask so often. And, and so I was looking for a new dance class. And so I Googled my neighborhood and flamenco. And it turned out there's a studio a mile from where I live. And so I was like, well, now I have no excuse. Um, yeah. So I just started going. And at first, at first it was, you know, once a week, one or two classes a week. Um, and then, I don't know, it just, the more I did it, the more it felt like, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a woo woo person. I don't, I, I don't, I'm, I don't believe in God anymore. I don't, you know, like I don't, but doing flamenco, it felt like, it felt like my body had always wanted to do this. It oh. had always wanted to move this way and had been waiting for me to take the class. And that's not to say that it came super fast to me and that I was instantly wonderful at it. I struggled as any beginner would, but once I would get it, I would be like, Oh yes, this is exact. Like I, there, there was just like, it was always exciting to do, even if it was like a boring little nothing step, it was always exciting. And, um, and then I started doing it every day. And now wow. I have a, I have a daily flamenco practice. I get up every day at six. 
And then I flamenco from seven to eight. And I, wow. just, you know, I, if I'm, if I have a performance coming up, I practice what I've got coming up for performance. If I don't have a performance coming up, I practice whatever I learned in class um, or I'll just improvise to music or whatever. But it, it's so, it's so satisfying and it, um, and it's so, because flamenco is very much like acting. It's, it's all about being real and alive in the moment. It's very improvisational. Even when, even when you're doing a choreography that you know, there's always little, little variations on it, little, little ways that you make it your own. Um, there, like, unlike ballet, there is no established line in flamenco because you know you don't have everybody doing it together, and you all have to look the same, and you all have to have the same body type. There is no perfect way to do flamenco. It meets you where you are, and because of that, there's no, and because there's no right way to do it, you just do it your way, and that's the right way for you. And so it it encourages so much personality from the dancer so much um so much emotion because it's like it's however i'm doing it is the right way because it's me you know there's technique and th and and of course all that but but the expression is you and that's what like you're watching somebody be the most alive when they do that they're because they're you know they, they're working so hard you're you're putting all your effort into it you're sweating like crazy it's just like everything and then you like if you're lucky you have this great little moment of truth where you like you move in a way and then like and then the audience goes oh hey because they you know they, they recognize something in that and there, there's there's just it's so thrilling even when there's no audience it's still very fun that's it i'm booking my lessons i'm going straight down the road we'll there's make a place good in, like, for everyone man, that's amazing i'm so happy that you have such a passion for something outside of the arts as well well I shouldn't the dance is a part of the arts but out of the arts that you're known for um, yeah. a lot of us I'm, I'm guilty of being passionate about filmmaking and and music but outside of that um I'm not really passionate about um, other things that maybe I, I should be or could be and funnily enough being I'm 43 and I don't really try new things anymore and I think a lot of us I don't know what it is that what happens why we don't try and use stuff there's some inbuilt thing in me i can't speak to everyone else where i think oh well you know when i was younger a friend of mine always quotes me takes the piss out of me because i always say oh well, when i was younger i would have done that oh if i was younger i could have done that but you know speaking to you and hearing you and and your passion is bursting through the screen yeah um <laughs> maybe i should try something new thank you for enlightening me you're welcome i i encourage you to be to try something new i think i think this society re reinforces a lot of the idea that you can't teach an old dog new tricks yeah. that's actually not true um <laughs> neuroplasticity is a thing the brain is always changing yes. um i i think um and you know not that you not that you have to have interests outside of filmmaking but um i like having especially because flamenco engages the whole body and writing can be very sedentary and filmmaking yeah. can involve a lot of sitting down and meetings. And, and so it's like, I love doing something that, you know, uses the whole organism. <laughs> yes, yes. Good on you, good on you. Emily, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much you're taking the time me. to speak to me. It's the Christmas period, the holiday season. Um, so I know it's not easy and people are with family and friends and drinking eggnog or doing whatever they like to do. So I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to me. Have you thought of upgrading your cinematography game? Would you like to have an ASC cinematographer mentor you for free? Join veteran cinematographer Suki Medenzovic, ASC, Disney, Pixar, FX Networks, Netflix, American Horror Story, as he teaches you how to create beautiful images using three lighting techniques he has mastered on film sets over his 30 plus years in the film industry. Each technique uses basic, low-cost lighting equipment so that anyone can achieve beautiful visuals no matter your project's budget. If you want to take your cinematography to the next level, visit FilmmakingConversations.com to sign up for instant access.